Jurassic Park by Michael Crichton, read by Anthony Vasquez. A faint crackling sound like a fire in a fireplace. Something warm and wet tickled Grant's ankle. He opened his eyes and saw an enormous beige head. The head tapered to a flat mouth shaped like the bill of a duck. The eyes protruding above the flat duck bill were gentle and soft like a cow's. The duck mouth opened and chewed branches on the limb where Grant was sitting. He saw large flat teeth in the cheek. The warm lips touched his ankle again as the animal chewed. A duck-billed hadrosaur. He was astonished to see it up close. Not that he was afraid, all the species of duck-billed dinosaurs were herbivorous, and this one acted exactly like a cow. Even though it was huge, its manner was so calm and peaceful, Grant didn't feel threatened. He stayed where he was on the branch, careful not to move, and watched as it ate. The reason Grant was astonished was that he had a proprietary feeling about this animal. It was probably a myosaur from the Lake Cretaceous in Montana. With John Horner, Grant had been the first to describe the species. Myosaurs had an uncurved lip, which gave them the appearance of smiling. The name meant Good Mother Lizard. Myosaurs were thought to protect their eggs until the babies were born and could take care of themselves. Grant heard an insistent chirping, and the big head swung down. He moved just enough to see the baby hadrosaur scampering around the feet of the adult. The baby was dark beige with black spots. The adult bent her head low to the ground and waited, unmoving, while the baby stood up on its hind legs, resting its front legs on the mother's jaw and ate the branches that protruded from the side of the mother's mouth. The mother waited patiently until the baby had finished eating and dropped back down to all fours again. Then the big head came back up toward Grant. The hadrosaur continued to eat just a few feet from him. Grant looked at the two elongated air holes on top of the flat upper bill. Apparently the dinosaur couldn't smell Grant. And even though the left eye was looking right at him, for some reason the hadrosaur didn't react to him. He remembered how the tyrannosaur had failed to see him the previous night. Grant decided on an experiment. He coughed. Instantly, the hadrosaur froze, the big head suddenly still, the jaws no longer chewing. Only the eye moved, looking for the source of the sound. Then after a moment, when there seemed to be no danger, the animal resumed chewing. Amazing, Grant thought. Sitting in his arms, Lex opened her eyes and said, Hey, what's that? The hadrosaur trumpeted in his arm, a loud resonant honk that so startled Lex that she nearly fell out of the tree. The hadrosaur pulled its head away from the branch and trumpeted again. Don't make her mad, Tim said from the branch above. The baby chirped and scurried beneath the mother's legs as the hadrosaur stepped away from the tree. The mother cocked her head and peered inquisitively at the branch where Grant and Lex were sitting. With its upturned, smiling lips, the dinosaur had a comical appearance. Is it dumb? Lex said. No, Grant said. You just surprised her. Well, Lex said, is she going to let us down or what? The hadrosaur had backed ten feet away from the tree. She honked again. Grant had the impression she was trying to frighten them away, but the dinosaur didn't really seem to know what to do. She acted confused and uneasy. They waited in silence, and after a minute, the hadrosaur approached the branch again, jaws moving in anticipation. She was clearly going to resume eating. Forget it, Lex said. I'm not staying here. She started to climb down the branches. At her movement, the hadrosaur trumpeted in fresh alarm. Grant was amazed. He thought, it really can't see us when we don't move. And after a minute, it literally forgets that we're here. This was just like the Tyrannosaur, another classic example of amphibian visual cortex. Studies of frogs had shown that amphibians only saw moving things like insects. If something didn't move, they literally didn't see it. The same thing seemed to be true of dinosaurs. In any case, the myosaur now seemed to find these strange creatures climbing down the tree too upsetting. With a final honk, she nudged her baby and lumbered slowly away. She paused once, looked back at them, then continued on. They reached the ground. Lex shook herself off. Both children were covered in a layer of fine dust. All around them, the grass had been flattened. There were streaks of blood and a sour smell. Grant looked at his watch. We better get going, kids, he said. Not me, Lex said. I'm not walking out there anymore. We have to. Why? Because, Grant said, we have to tell them about the boat. Since they can't seem to see us on the motion sensors, we have to go all the way back ourselves. It's the only way. Why can't we take the raft, Tim said. What raft? 
Tim pointed to the low concrete maintenance building with the bars where they had spent the night. It was 20 yards away across the field. I saw a raft back there, he said. Grant immediately understood the advantages. It was now 7 o'clock in the morning. They had at least 8 miles to go. If they could take a raft along the river, they would make much faster progress than going over land. Let's do it, Grant said. Arnold punched the visual search mode and watched as the monitors began to scan throughout the park, the images changing every two seconds. It was tiring to watch, but it was the fastest way to find Nedry's jeep, and Muldoon had been adamant about that. He had gone out with Gennaro to look at the stampede, but now that it was daylight, he wanted the car found. He wanted the weapons. His intercom clicked. Mr. Arnold, may I have a word with you, please? It was Hammond. He sounded like the voice of God. You want to come here, Mr. Hammond? No, Mr. Arnold, Hammond said. Come to me. I'm in the genetics lab with Dr. Wu. We'll be waiting for you. Arnold sighed and stepped away from the screens. Grant stumbled deep in the gloomy recesses of the building. He pushed past five-gallon containers of herbicide, tree pruning equipment, spare tires for a jeep, coils of cyclone fencing, hundred-pound fertilizer bags, stacks of brown ceramic insulators, empty motor oil cans, work lights, and cables. I don't see any raft. Keep going. Bags of cement, lengths of copper pipe, green mesh, and two plastic oars hung on clips on the concrete wall. Okay, he said, but where's the raft? It must be there somewhere, Tim said. You never saw a raft? No, I just assumed it was here. Poking among the junk, Grant found no raft. But he did find a set of plans rolled up and speckled with mold from humidity stuck back in a metal cabinet on the wall. He spread the plans on the floor, brushing away a big spider. He looked at them for a long time. I'm hungry. Just a minute. They were detailed topographical charts for the main area of the island where they now were. According to this, the lagoon narrowed into the river they had seen earlier, which twisted northward, right through the aviary, and onto within a half mile of the visitor lodge. He flipped back through the pages. How to get to the lagoon? According to the plans, there should be a door at the back of the building they were in. Grant looked up and saw it, recessed back in the concrete wall. The door was wide enough for a car. Opening it, he saw a paved road running straight down toward the lagoon. The road was dug below ground level, so it couldn't be seen from above. It must be another service road. And it led to a dock at the edge of the lagoon, and clearly stenciled on the dock was raft storage. Hey, Tim said, look at this. He held out a metal case to Grant. Opening it, Grant found a compressed air pistol and cloth belt that held darts. There were six darts in all, each as thick as his finger, labeled Moro 709. Good work, Tim. He slung the belt around his shoulder and stuck the gun in his trousers. Is it a tranquilizer gun? I'd say so. What about the boat? Lex said. I think it's on the dock, Grant said. They started down the road. Grant carried the oars on his shoulder. I hope it's a big raft, Lex said, because I can't swim. Don't worry, he said. Maybe we can catch some fish, she said. They walked down the road with the sloping embankment rising up on both sides of them. They heard a deep, rhythmic snorting sound, but Grant could not see where it was coming from. Are you sure there's a raft down there? Lex said, wrinkling her nose. Probably, Grant said. The rhythmic snorting became louder as they walked, but they also heard a steady, droning, buzzing sound. When they reached the end of the road at the edge of the small concrete dock, Grant froze in shock. The Tyrannosaur was right there! It was sitting upright in the shade of a tree, its hind legs stretched out in front. Its eyes were open, but it was not moving except for its head, which lifted and fell gently with each snorting sound. The buzzing came from the clouds of flies that surrounded it, crawling over its face and slack jaws, its bloody fangs and the red haunch of a killed hadrosaur that lay on its side behind the Tyrannosaur. The Tyrannosaur was only 20 yards away. Grant felt sure it must have seen him, but the big animal did not respond. It just sat there. It took him a moment to realize the Tyrannosaur was asleep, sitting up, but asleep. He signaled to Tim and Lex to stay where they were. Grant walked slowly forward onto the dock, in full view of the Tyrannosaur. The big animal continued to sleep, snoring softly. Near the end of the dock, a wooden shed was painted green to blend with the foliage. Grant quietly unlatched the door and looked inside. 
He saw a half dozen orange life vests hanging on the wall, several rolls of wire mesh fencing, some coils of rope, and two big rubber cubes sitting on the floor. The cubes were strapped tight with flat rubber belts. Rafts. He looked back at Lex. She mouthed, No boat. He nodded, Yes. The Tyrannosaur raised its foreland to swipe at the flies buzzing around its snout, but otherwise it did not move. Grant pulled one of the cubes out onto the dock. It was surprisingly heavy. He freed the straps, found the inflation cylinder. With a loud hiss, the rubber began to expand, and then with a... It popped fully open on the dock. The sound was fearfully loud in their ears. Grant turned, stared up at the dinosaur. The Tyrannosaur grunted and snorted. It began to move. Grant braced himself to run, but the animal shifted its ponderous bulk, and then it settled back against the tree trunk and gave a long, growling belch. Lex looked disgusted, waving her hand in front of her face. Grant was soaked in sweat from the tension. He dragged the rubber raft across the dock and flopped into the water with a loud splash. The dinosaur continued to sleep. Grant tied the boat up to the dock and returned to the shed to take out two life preservers. He put these in the boat, then waved for the kids to come out onto the dock. Pale with fear, Lex waved back. No. He gestured. Yes! The Tyrannosaur continued to sleep. Grant stabbed in the air with an emphatic finger. Lex came silently, and he gestured for her to get into the raft. Then Tim got in, and they both put on their life vests. Grant got in and pushed off. The raft drifted silently out into the lagoon. Grant picked up his paddles and fitted them into the oarlocks. They moved farther from the dock. Lex sat back and sighed loudly with relief. Then she looked stricken and put her hand over her mouth. Her body shook with muffled sounds. She was suppressing a cough. She always coughed at the wrong times. Lex, Tim whispered fiercely, looking back toward the shore. She shook her head miserably and pointed to her throat. He knew what she meant, a tickle in her throat. What she needed was a drink of water. Grant was rowing. Tim leaned over the side of the raft and scooped his hand in the lagoon, holding his cupped hand toward her. Lex coughed loudly, explosively. In Tim's ears, the sound echoed across the water like a gunshot. The dinosaur yawned lazily and scratched behind its ear with its hind foot, just like a dog. It yawned again. It was groggy after its big meal, and it woke up slowly. On the boat, Lex was making gargling sounds. Lex, shut up, Tim said. It, she whispered, and then she coughed again. Grant rode hard, moving the raft powerfully into the center of the lagoon. On the shore, the Tyrannosaur stumped. I couldn't help it, Timmy! Lex shrieked miserably. I couldn't help it! Shh! Grant was rowing as fast as he could. Anyway, it doesn't matter, she said. We're far enough away. He can't swim. Of course he can swim, you little idiot! Tim shouted at her. On the shore, the Tyrannosaur stopped off the dock and plunged into the water. They moved strongly into the lagoon after them. Well, how should I know, she said. Everybody knows Tyrannosaurus can swim. It's all in the books. In a way, all reptiles can swim. Snakes can't. Of course snakes can, you idiot! Settle down, Grant said. Hold on to something. Grant was watching the Tyrannosaur, noticing how the animals swam. The Tyrannosaur was now chest deep in the water, but it could hold its big head high above the surface. Then Grant realized the animal wasn't swimming. It was walking. Because moments later, only the very top of the head, the eyes and nostrils, protruded above the surface. By then, it looked like a crocodile, and it swam like a crocodile, swinging its big tail back and forth so the water churned behind it. Behind the head, Grant saw the hump of the back, and the ridges along the length of tail as it occasionally broke the surface. Exactly like a crocodile, he thought unhappily. The biggest crocodile in the world. I'm sorry, Dr. Grant, Lex wailed. I didn't mean it. Grant glanced over his shoulder. The lagoon was no more than a hundred yards wide here, and they had almost reached the center. If he continued, the water would become shallow again. The Tyrannosaur would be able to walk again, and he would move faster in shallow water. Grant swung the boat around and began to row north. What are you doing? The Tyrannosaur was now just a few yards away. Grant could hear its sharp, snorting breaths as it came closer. Grant looked at the paddles in his hands, but they were light plastic, not weapons at all. The Tyrannosaur threw its head back. Why? Showing rows of curved teeth, and then in a great muscular spasm, lunged forward the raft, just missing the rubber gunwale. The huge skull slapping down, the raft rocking away on the crest of the splash. The Tyrannosaur sank below the surface, leaving gurgling bubbles. The lagoon was still. Lex gripped the gunwale handles and looked back. Did he drown? No, Grant said. He saw bubbles, then a faint ripple along the surface, coming toward the boat. 
Hang on, he shouted, as the head fucked up with the rubber, bending the boat and lifting it into the air, spinning them crazily before it splashed down again. Do something, Alexis screamed. Do something! Grant pulled the air pistol out of his belt. It looked pitifully small in his hand, but there was a chance that if he shot the animal in a sensitive spot, in the eye or the nose, the drive on the surface beside the boat opened his jaws and roared. Grant aimed and fired. The dart flashed in the light and smacked into the cheek. The shook its head and roared again. And suddenly they heard an answering roar floating across the water toward them. Looking back, Grant saw the juvenile T-Rex on the shore, crouched over the killed sauropod, claiming the kill as its own. The juvenile slashed at the carcass, then raised its head high and bellowed. The big Tyrannosaur saw it too, and the response was immediate. He turned back to protect his kill, swimming strongly toward the shore. He's going away, Lex squealed, clapping her hands. He's going away! Nah, 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 stupid dinosaur! From the shore, the juvenile roared defiantly. Enraged, the big Tyrannosaur burst from the boat at full speed, water spilling from its enormous body as it raced up the hill past the dock. The juvenile ducked its head and fled, its jaws still filled with dragon flesh. The big Tyrannosaur chased it, racing past the dead sauropod disappearing over the hill. They heard its final threatening bellow, and then the raft moved to the north, around a bend in the lagoon to the river. Exhausted from rolling, Grant collapsed back, his chest beating. He couldn't catch his breath. He lay gasping in the raft. Are you okay, Dr. Grant? Lex asked. From now on, will you just do what I tell you? Okay. She sighed as if he had just made the most unreasonable demand in the world. She trailed her arm in the water for a while. You stopped rowing, she said. I'm tired, Grant said. And how come we're still moving? Grant sat up. She was right. The raft drifted steadily north. There must be a current. The current was carrying them north toward the hotel. He looked at his watch and was astonished to see it was 15 minutes past 7. Only 15 minutes had passed since he had last looked at his watch. It seemed like two hours. Grant lay back against the rubber gunwales, closed his eyes, and slept.